Some of you channel supporters want me to talk about biotech companies that's using the RNAi technology. Today, I'll dissect the technology to see if it's worth investing. Also, I'll give an update on my put options in November as there's a small change in my strategy, so stay tuned. But before that, let's transcribe that intro. I've been teaching biology since 2004. On this channel, I hope to simplify and explain the science behind the companies that's driving the genomics revolution one video at a time. Like clockwork, I added another $657.36 for my put options in November. The premium is much lower than the previous months. What gives? There are two reasons. First, I've been doing put options on a company that I really love for the past 6 months. However, the price has shot up so high that I'm priced out of it. So I was thinking to myself, what other company can I do put options on? At the same time, Illuminous stock price have been going on a sale because of Grail's acquisition issue. Also, the government bond yields have been steadily rising and this will cause the stock price of growth companies to get hammered. So instead of buying more Illumina shares in these turbulent times, I've decided to do put options on this company. This way, I can take advantage of the lower prices as well as earning some premiums even though it's lower than what I previously collected. One contract of 100 shares of Illumina have been sold at the strike price of $350 with a one-month expiry on the 17th of December 2021. One. If Illumina's stock price remains above the strike price during this time, I get to keep the premium and nothing else happens. If it falls below $350, then I may get assigned 100 shares, which I'm happy to own and it could be materials for a new video. Even then, I will still get to keep the premium. I don't really like to trade biotech stock options, as I've mentioned in earlier videos. However, this was an opportunity considering how strong Illumina sales have been in this year. If you're interested in put options, I put links to all the videos where I've talked about put options below for your convenience. Now, let's move on. Traditionally, the control of gene expression occurs at five levels in a human cell. It starts off with the DNA organization, transcription, post-transcription, translation, and post-translation. Translation level of gene expression control is where RNAi mainly works, which causes a shutdown to occur. As a result, no proteins are produced. RNAi is also known as interference RNA. This comprises of double-stranded RNA, which is unusual because they are typically single-stranded. There are two types of RNAi, microRNA and siRNA. Generally, siRNA are longer structures and are more specific to the mRNAs that it is supposed to shut down. In contrast, microRNA are shorter and have a broader range of mRNAs it can shut down. On that basis, biotech companies design siRNA to target the treatment of diseases. However, before we get there, you need to understand how RNAi generally works. The RNAi typically binds to an enzyme known as dicer, which cuts them down to size. The trimmed RNAi are then complexed with argonaut protein, which unravels the double-stranded structure. Argonaut then retains only one of the strands and uses it to recognize any mRNA. SIRNA will be forming a 100% complementary base pairing, whereas microRNAs will only form half or even lesser. Once bound, argonaut then cleaves the mRNA, and once cleaved, this activates the mRNA degradation, thus preventing translation to protein. The process is quite complex, so feel free to click on the timestamps in the video description below to rehash it again. So the next question is, how do these biotech companies make use of the technology to target the treatment of diseases? There are a number of companies that's using this technology, but I'm specifically referencing Arrowhead because you asked for it in the comments. The first question to ask is that if I were to design the siRNA and target the specific shutdown of an mRNA, how would I bring this siRNA into the target cell? Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals chose to do so directly. Initially, they used an additional molecule known as DPC mixed with their siRNA together, targeting the hepatitis B virus as their first product. However, two clinical trials of this product were terminated. Associated patents for this treatment were granted, but none of the inventors listed are part of the executive team. 
On that note, interestingly, there are no chief scientific officers in the leadership team currently. And slightly less than half of the stable of new treatments are either licensed away or partnering with another pharmaceutical company to develop it. This is quite ominous because if there are no strong scientific figures to lead the developmental efforts, then the company will have very little moat. And to add to that, the termination of the first drug trials may indicate weak scientific fundamentals. Speaking of which, the introduction of RNAi directly into the blood and hoping that it will reach the target cell is not desirable. This is because it may be susceptible to degradation with enzymes in the circulatory system. Better to incorporate it into an LMP, electroporate it directly, or to use a viral vector to carry the payload. Beam therapeutics, anyone? And I'm not done yet. In certain diseases, we observe that some proteins are overexpressed, and this is indeed true for cancer and viral infections. So, the RNAi is introduced to inactivate the mRNA, preventing the translation into proteins. Less proteins means treatment is effected. What's inadequate with this scenario is that the offending cause is still present. Ayo! RNAi technology is treatment and not cure. Let me explain. In cancer, proto-oncogenes get mutated to oncogenes, and these genes may result in overexpression, creating more proteins than usual. SIRNA can be used to reduce the number of proteins, yes, but this only occurs over a limited period of time. Using the data from Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals in their work on hepatitis B virus as an example, you can see the reduction in the first 10 days and then subsequently increase afterwards. In the case of cancer, the mutation still persists and the RNAi does nothing to it. This is why beam therapeutics is so important because it removes the offending mutation, giving rise to a cure. Not only that, there are two more problems associated with the use of RNAi in a cell. First, there is a feedback mechanism of gene expression. For example, P53 protein in cells are tightly regulated. Any excess will be rapidly degraded by MDM2 proteins as a result of the increase in gene expression of MDM2 gene. In cancer, P53 levels are low, so the idea is to target the reduction of MDM2 to increase P53 levels. When doing so, P53 levels do initially increase, but MDM2 gene expression will increase in response. So after the initial suppression of MDM2 by siRNA, for example, the dosage must increase in tandem with the increase of MDM2 gene expression. How do you correctly titrate the concentration to the optimum at the correct time according to the amount of gene expression? It's too complex. Hi, yo! In addition, there's another phenomenon known as crosstalk with RNA editing. The details I will not discuss in today's video. But I would like to note that this mechanism is counteractive against the RNAi mechanism, which further complicates the process. So, I have doubts over the missing scientific lead who is crucial in directing the development of RNAi treatments in Arrowhead. Also, RNAi treatment is a downstream solution, not a cure. Finally, there are biological mechanisms inside the cell that can counteract and reduce the efficacy of the RNAi treatments. Because of all of the reasons, I'm sorry, but I'm out. <laughs>